So February 22 is a very special day. Thank you, Paul. Um, it's a memorial of a famous birthday. Uh, you know, why do we celebrate President's Day? George Washington's birthday. But it's famous from my family standpoint because tomorrow will be my father's birthday. He passed away almost 50 years ago now there at Andrews University. And so tomorrow is his birthday and then Monday will be my birthday. So we're marking uh, milestones in the Johns family. So I dedicate this to my father, Alger F. Johns. And he's the only one that ever taught a, a full class in biblical chronology for seminary students. He didn't have uh, a large class because it's an esoteric subject. So I've inherited his love of chronology and you will detect that as we go through some of these things and these dates. Now, I want to make sure that um, to advance it, we just hit enter. Yeah. I want to make sure that um, you know where we're going. It's like a journey. And I, I call chronology the milestones on the roadmap of life, only we're going backwards in time instead of forwards. And so I'm going to be your guide. I'm going to point out milestones. I'm going to interpret things that you probably have never seen interpreted that way before. So you're welcome to question or even we have two mics. If you want to uh, interject and stop me at a certain point, that's fine. Uh, the story begins with dendrochronology. It's not endrochronology. Endrochronology, study of uh, what? Glands and, and all the products that glands make. But dendro is from the uh, Hebrew, I mean the Greek. Dendros or dendron is the way it's spelled, which means simply wood or a tree. So this is using wood and tree rings for dating. Now, the idea of linking this with the Bible is not new to me. Dr. William Shea, who is a graduate of Loma Linda, MD, went on in midlife and got a PhD in archaeology from Ann Arbor. And I've read his dissertation and in it he has tried to identify biblical events from famine records in Egypt mostly, but Palestine, mostly Egypt because we have a lot of documents and monuments. And so he and I have corresponded the last 25 years or more on the possibility of using tree rings. And he's uh, somewhat endorsed me. He hasn't seen all this, so I don't want to have a blanket endorsement from him. But he's endorsing the possibility that we can nail down some biblical dates using dendrochronology. Well, outside of this, independent of Dr. Shea and my studies, we have a Mike Bailey right down here. Um, one of the top dendrochronologists in the last 30 or 40 years. He's the one that developed the Irish tree ring chronology by digging up oak trees that are perfectly preserved. They're pickled in bogs. They slice them up, they count the rings, and they have rings at, or trees at different levels, and then they overlap the rings just like bristlecone pine and they work their way back further and further with overlapped rings because the trees rarely get beyond 300 years in age, unlike bristlecone pines. And so he's using tree rings from Northern Ireland to date British events like Sir Arthur and his court or to date biblical events like the Exodus. So I'm going to follow his methodology with different Conclusions. Now, where are we going on this tour? We're going to land on the date of 1479 BC for the Exodus. I want to make it very clear where we're going. 
before you say, oh no, that's impossible, hear me out on that. Because the traditional date of conservative scholars is 1445 or 1446. And so I'm already our pathway is diverging from tradition. And I'm okay with that, and I hope you are too. Okay, here's an actual tree that I'm going to use for the presentation. It's a slice of a Northern Ireland oak tree. The oak is even better than bristlecone pine for dating because they only have one or two examples in thousands of years of oak rings and oak trees. One or two examples where in one year two rings could be produced because it's a different type of wood. It's oak and not pine. With pine sometimes you can get double or triple rings as some of you have studied. But oak, it's practically never, so it's not a factor. So one ring, one year. And now they have a sequence going back about 7,000 years plus. Hope that doesn't alarm you too much. Uh, in faded writing, sorry I couldn't enhance the slide. This is a page out of his book. And in my photocopy, I put down 18 years. So that, uh, the bracket there shows 18 years of the narrowest, thinnest rings. So let's translate that. Let's interpret it as extremely uh, dire conditions, very, very uh, antithetical to tree growth. Now, that can happen with cold winters, right? That can happen with drought. But keep in mind, these oaks are growing in bogs or right on the edges of bogs. And even in drought, bogs still have some water. They don't dry up completely, at least in Northern Ireland. And so there is some growth. So 18 years in a row, and it's this middle section here, you can count to 18, only one cell, tree ring cell, is been produced per year. Usually it's multiple cells. So the, the spring growth or late spring growth is cut off and it stops growing the rest of the summer. Why? Because extremely cold summers, maybe 20 to 30 degrees colder than average. That's what it's indicating there. And with extreme cold conditions, you can actually have drought. Why? Because warmer air retains more moisture, colder air uh, doesn't have a lot of moisture. Now, you're beginning to question, I can tell, uh, can we connect this with the Bible in the Middle East? Because we're talking about Northern Ireland, see. Here's another section in brackets up there, and you can count seven narrow rings. Seven. There are a few cases where you have seven rings in a row that are extremely narrow in Ireland. Just a few. This is one of the few, and this happens to be the one from the time of Joseph. We, the more modern uh, conservative interpretation is to put Joseph now in the period of the Hyksos. I won't go a lot into Egyptian history, but the Hyksos were not Egyptians. They belonged to the Semite branch of people, descendants of Shem, just like the Israelites were descendants of Shem. And so there was some compatibility, and they're, they're the ones that invited Jacob down into Egypt. So that's becoming a well-known, um, I wouldn't say fact, but a, a well-known scenario for explaining how the Israelites ended in Egypt. And I, I realize that's uh, a different date than a lot of traditional dates. So there's seven rings in a row. I'm going to suggest that they connect with the time of Joseph. And in the third year of Joseph's famine, Jacob and his family were brought to Egypt. The brothers came a year earlier, the second year of the famine. Scripture is very clear. It was the second year when they came. But it took about a year for 
Jacob to gather up his uh, belongings and wives, children and grandchildren and so on, and bring them to Egypt. And when did he come? 1625 BC. So remember those two dates, 1479 Exodus, 1625 BC for Isidus. You'll see that word, I think I have it up here somewhere, but no. Anyway, you'll see that word Isidus is a technical term for entering Egypt from the Greek word ice, which means into, not X is out of, ice into. So here we have, um, here's the third point or intersection of the triangle. You mentioned a triangle, you know, in the introduction that I'm talking about volcanoes. I'm talking about tree rings. I'm talking about biblical chronology, like you have a giant triangle here. Here's the uh, volcanic uh, aspect of dendrochronology. As you know, we've had major volcanic eruptions. Anyone here experienced the effects of Mount St. Helens? Any of you? I thought maybe Gary. Yeah, and some of you have been up there and visited. I visited a year later. I know we had Briscoe up there. Some of us got in a plane and we flew all around. Uh, only about a year later, I think. And it was moonscape. It was the most desolate scene I've ever seen. Well, it was May 18, and there, the first calculation was there about two cubic kilometers or so of ash going up in the atmosphere. I checked this week and it's less than that, but I think still the original estimate is pretty accurate. That's um, about one cubic mile or so, maybe a little less, going up in the atmosphere, spread around the Earth. As a result, the whole Earth's average temperature cools down. Now, it's less than a degree uh, Fahrenheit for Mount St. Helens. It's just a little eruption. We've had much bigger eruptions, and the bigger ones connect with tree ring dating. Here's one of the biggest eruptions uh, reflected in bristlecone pines. This is a cross section. You can clearly see the bands across horizontally. And if you look at the middle of the slide, you have a lot of damage and wavy uh, cells. The wavy cells indicate uh, freezing of the bristlecone pine trees, actually frost, during the growing season. And you have to have frost that gets calculated for at least 36 to 48 hours with temperatures below 20 degrees Fahrenheit. This is midsummer, the growing season, up the road in the White Mountains. Can you imagine if it was under 20 degrees Celsius, uh, Fahrenheit in the San Bernardino Mountains, that would be devastating, especially the valleys, and it frees out all the uh, orange growths and everything. So this is called frost ring damage. That happens extremely rarely, and the only known cause of that would be a volcanic eruption cooling the Earth rapidly and drastically so that summers were almost now non-existent. So that's what we look for. It's kind of a, a marker level. Oh, by the way, that's dated to 1628 BC. And could that be related to seven years of famine with seven years of tree rings? We'll get to that uh, a little later in the presentation. But I want to start with the 18 years of eruptions. That's in 1159 BC. Similar damage on tree rings, only the effects lasted for 18 years. The only time in recorded history or human history that we know about where you've had 18 years in a row with famine. And that's 1158 to 1141 BC. And then the one I just showed you is 1628 BC. So those are the two dates. They're 
there are endpoints. And you want to see if biblical history will fit nicely between those two points. We don't want to force it. We don't want to put a, uh, a square peg into a round hole. And I, I pray that I don't do that. But we're going to see that the scripture allows that to happen and scripture has exactly the same number of years between those two anchor points as in dendrochronology. Now that's a tall order to film. But we have some outside help, uh, help, uh, you know, 12th century BC is when people were recording history and Herodotus got some of the old records. He was probably in the third century BC, but he, uh, he knew about the memory of the Trojan War. And he, by the way, Trojan War actually happened for decades. Scholars said that was just a Greek myth, but that actually happened around 1200 BC. And within about two generations of the Trojan War, according to Herodotus, Herodotus and other Greek historians, that's when they had an 18-year famine. And the people in Asia Minor called Lydians, by the way, they descended right from uh, Noah and um, there is a reference, I believe, to Lud, L-U-D, in Genesis 10. I'll have to look that up, but I'm trusting my memory. And these are the Lydians that settled up there in what is now Turkey, right in the middle of 18th century. So we should look for effects of a famine. Well, in Scripture, the Book of Judges has a continuous record for many hundreds of years. In fact, 1 Kings 6.1 says uh, there are 480 years between the Exodus and the founding of the temple. And there's a lot of history there. And so we should survey the history of the book of Judges to see if we have reference to 18-year famine. Well, the first clue, which I don't have on my slides, the first clue is the book of Ruth. And you know, Ruth, not Ruth, her mother-in-law, um, who was the mother-in-law? Not Elizabeth. Naomi, Naomi the mother-in-law, had two daughters, Orpah and another daughter. They had to flee. They were, uh, he, she was a widow, and so she had two daughters, fatherless, and they fled to the land of Moab. How long were they there? Chapter one of the book of Ruth said, after 10 years, they could return back. And that was famine conditions. So we have right in the middle of the book of Ruth, a reference to a famine at least 10 years long. Tree rings record no other famine conditions except an 18 year famine at that time. And if you go back with the genealogy at the end of Ruth, go all the way back to uh, Ruth itself and that story and the 10 year famine uh, that takes you about to the middle of the 12th century BC. Is there about four or five generations going to David and so on from Ruth and Boaz? Well, I didn't put that in because uh, that's an extra bonus, but I do want to look for famine conditions. Um, the Ammonites oppressed Israel for 18 years, and we're going to look at that in a minute. Further, the Moabites, when they invaded Israel, their king Eglon, they stayed for 18 years. So here are two places that magical number 18 appears. And they were helped by the Ammonites. Well, it was the Ammonites, and I'll go back um, one slide. It was the Ammonites during the time of Jephthah that uh, invaded Israel, and we're going to focus on Jephthah because he's the key, key player in this 18-year famine. The Midianites, the Midianites invaded Israel for seven years. Could that be a time of famine? I mentioned there were several seven-year famines that have happened over a period of 7,000 years, so possibly that's also a, a a famine that's on tree rings. I haven't 
pursue that aggressively to see how I would date the story of Gideon. But if you read that story, remember when the angel called Gideon to action to be a leader. Gideon was threshing wheat where? It's the spring harvest. In the wine press where the fall harvest would be displayed. Now why would he do that? He didn't want the Midianites to find uh, the fresh wheat that he was uh, threshing. Right? That makes sense. And then go further in the story. When Gideon took his 300 men and camped outside the Midianites stealthily, Gideon crept up at night and listened to the talk of two Midianite soldiers. What were they talking about? They were talking about a loaf of bread in a dream. This one guy had a dream. Why would you be dreaming about bread? Possible clue that it's famine conditions and that would be a natural thing that you would want. That's highest on your mind. Oh, I'd love to have some bread, homemade bread. <laughs> so these are little clues. They, they're not proofs, but they fit the story very nicely. And so many years later, probably over 100 years later, you have the Ammonites invading again, not the same time as the Midianites, time of Gideon. And there was an 18-year famine, and it ended with the time of Jephthah at the bottom of the screen there. And the end is pinpointed to 300 years after the Israelites conquered Ammonite territory. Judges 11.26, I've underlined it there. Well, tree rings give us a date for the end of the 18-year famine. It was um, 1141 B.C., 1141. And it probably took uh, Gideon another year or two to rally the troops and finally drive out the uh, Ammonites. So I think we're safe to say that approximately 1140 BC, according now to the biblical record, uh, the Ammonites were driven out if that same 18-year famine is in the tree rings and if that same 18-year famine is referenced by Herodotus, the ancient historian. I realize there's lots of ifs, but when you add them all together, they point in the same direction. Well, I display here Bible chronology. It's too boring to go over all of this. But if you add up all the reigns of the judges and you have some overlap, uh, you come back to the time of Jephthah, bottom of the screen, and he judged Israel for six years. A lot of people say that this is just mythology and these numbers are made up and there's no historicity. But I'm a historicist. I've always been. And the numbers of the Bible are accurate. That's the bottom line. If you go away with nothing else, the numbers in the Bible are amazingly accurate for the purpose that they're used. They're not always used for the same purposes we use them. But if you under, understand the purposes and the context and how they're used, amazing accuracy. Well. I mentioned that uh, you have to overlap some of the periods. Uh, right in the middle of the screen, it talks about the Philistines oppressing Israel 40 years. And Samson also ruled during that same 40 years. So don't add up extra 20 years for Samson because his 20 years are in included in the 40 years. And the Bible explains that. I have two texts. It says, and Samson judged Israel in the time of the Philistines 20 years. And just previously, it said their oppression was 40 years. So once you overlap it there, and you can also go back and overlap the 18-year famine during the time of the Midianites or Moabites. Yeah, the Moabites, not Midianites. The Moabites crossed over the Jordan River from south part of the Dead Sea. The Ammonites at the same time during eight years, 18 years crossed the north part 
and it's like a giant uh, forceps, giant forceps, and they took control of all of Israel at that time. And that's reflected in the tree ring dates. Uh, Jephthah, according to the Bible, and Bible chronology, accurate to the year, I believe, he started his rule in 1140 BC. And how does that fit with the 18 years of famine? It's right at the end. Maybe it's taken him a year or two to drive out the Ammonites fully. But when he starts marching against them, it's about 1140, maybe into 1141 BC. And like Goliath, who appeared opposite the camp of David and the Israelites, Jephthah, like a little Goliath, appears before the uh, camp of the Ammonites. You know, he felt safe. The Lord was protecting him. And he shouts to them. While Israel dwelt in Heshbon, that's a city uh, opposite Jordan, that's the capital of the Ammonite kingdom. And we have uh, archaeological digs there, and we're understanding a lot more about Ammonite history than we ever did. And they were thriving at this time, about 1140 uh, BC. They were, they were strong then. And he's, um, Jephthah is asking, well, why Israel has dwelt in Heshbon and its villages for 300 years, why did you, that is the Ammonites, not recover them? If you're going to protest about occupation, we hear a lot about occupied territory in, in the Middle East, and especially Palestine, Syria, and Iraq. Why did you not do something for 300 years? Well, they were speechless. And they hightailed it right out of uh, Canaan, at least Palestine, and went back to their old territory across to the east of the Jordan River. So most scholars say 300 years is an obviously rounded off number. Very suspect. You know, maybe 259 years or 329 years. But I'm a in a way, a literalist, when it comes to some of these chronological figures, I'm saying that they had a 300-year memorial then. They kept track of time ever since the Exodus. Now, you're kind of debating with me in your mind because we have another figure, 480 years, that has different results. And it has a later Exodus date. And later on, I can explain why the discrepancy, but I won't take time now. So we have a road map. I'm taking you on a 300-year road. And there are two ways to reach a similar destination, not identical. Let's go back in time. If you add, I, you see the math there. The math is simple. If you go back 300 years, 1439 BC or 1440, somewhere very close to that, is their years do not overlap identically our calendar. So you have to say uh, within a year of these dates. Uh, if you go back another 300 years, what do you get? You get uh, the wandering in the wilderness 40 years before then. So you add the extra 40 years to the 1439 BC, voila, you land right on the new Exodus date. In my opinion, it's worth pursuing. You're the first ones to hear it. I haven't uh, presented this. I should present it at a conference. If, uh, hear me out. Uh, we're not done on that part. But uh, I do want your input, any of you, you don't have to be an Old Testament scholar to give me some feedback on this. So what happens? The traditional date of 1446, 1445 is abandoned. The 480 years are the years that are rounded off. 
even though they seem more accurate. And the years that are the most accurate, going from Jephthah on back, are the most accurate in my thinking. Just flipping it around, kind of the opposite. So now, who's the pharaoh of the Exodus? That's the $64,000 question. Who's the pharaoh? Can we identify him? A pharaoh had to have died the year of the Exodus. That's my premise. I know a lot of scholars, conservative scholars, totally disagree with that. But we have at least three texts, one in Exodus 14:28 saying that the waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen and all the host of Pharaoh. Do you think Pharaoh was excluded and he survived and he was alive? It says all of them, not so much as one of them remained. Do you think Pharaoh himself was the one that remained alive and he could escape back to Egypt? No, the implication is he perished along with the others. And we have two other texts Deuteronomy and Psalms there. And it says that the Egyptians were destroyed. Now, were they half destroyed? No, the word de is destroyed. The same word used of the flood account. You know, were there a lot of survivors of the flood? No. The flood destroyed the Antilouv Antediluvians. Well, the traditional date puts the Exodus in the reign of Thutmosis III. And William Shea has manipulated Egyptian chronology. He's an Egyptologist by training, and I respect him. He's still alive today. I just checked this week to uh, see if he is, as far as I know. Yes? My point out on the internet last night, there was a note that Bill Shea had died. Oh, very recent. Yes. I was going to send him this presentation Monday of this week. Very recent. Wow, I'm sorry to hear that. You know, I speak of Bill Shea with the highest esteem because he was able to uh, cover med medical science. He was able to cover a lot of Old Testament history, and he was able to cover archaeology all at the same time. Brilliant mind. My father taught at La Sierra nearby when I was just a little kid, before fourth grade. Third grade is when we moved. And my dad, years later, told me about Bill Shea. He and one other name I won't mention, the other person is still alive, they were the two top students he ever had in terms of accomplishments. And so my dad always praised highly Bill Shea, so we need to pause to uh, remember him. So anyway, he solved the question of a pharaoh dying in the Exodus by taking the early dating of the Egyptian chronology and saying that Thutmosis III, who reigned for 54 years, started his reign in 1504 BC. That's not on the screen. 1504, and you subtract 54 years from that, he then died in 1450 B.C. And so Shea was putting the Exodus back a little earlier than Dr. Horn's chronology and the SDA Bible chronology. And as far as I know, that was the last date he suggested in his writings uh, about 15 years ago. He also was writing on this topic. I'm adopting the dating system there of Gary Bates. There's a link, the third link on your email. Go back to it if some of you are lovers of chronology like I am. I realize it turns a lot of people off, but if you want to dig your teeth into some solid reading, read Gary Bates with, uh, with creation.com um, there in Australia. And he upholds the a latest young chronology, or not the old chronology, the newest chronology for Egyptian history. And that's, that's when uh, Thutmose III died in 1425 that you can see at the top of the screen. So it's not 1450 anymore. And this is what scholars have already acknowledged that. You go to 
starting uh, the 1990s, there was a whole shift in dating of this phase. It's called the New Kingdom. And um, you have, if you like dynasties, you have the 18th dynasty and so on. I won't get into that. But according to the latest well-established chronology that is better established than any other Egyptian dating, Thutmose II died in 1479 BC. Well, William Shea actually suggested that in a chapter he wrote in the book Giving the Sense in 2003, published by Kriegel. You may want to get that book if you like Old Testament history. Read William Shea's chapter. And he starts out by almost arguing vociferously for Thutmose II being the pharaoh of the Exodus. But then he turns right around and says, but you have 1 Kings 6-1 and you have 480 years going back to the Exodus and so I cannot accept 1479. That's what he concludes. So who is the pharaoh of the Exodus? I'm trying to advance this. I'm not sure what it's doing. It's just taking its time. I'm advancing it there. Ta-da! I'm introducing for the first time what I think is the picture of the mummy of the pharaoh of the Exodus. Shriveled up. Now, first of all, you say, ah, oh, this is probably not Thutmose II because he drowned in the Red Sea, and maybe they have a substitute mummy. There are cases of substitute mummies that are buried in a royal burial. At least I've heard of one or two cases. But scholars have taken the mummy of his father, which also is preserved, and done imaging of this guy's face and the father's face and superimposed them. He has all the bone and skeletal features of his father, Thutmosis the first. So this is Thutmosis the second. Um, we can nail it down even more. Thutmosis the second died in the spring because his father took the throne on April 24. We have an exact date from Egyptology. Um, spring of the year. When did the Exodus happen? When? Yeah, when did they cross the Red Sea? Spring of the year. Got a pretty good fit there, don't we? Also, Thutmosis II died young. According to Maspero, I have a quote there showing that he died not much more than age 30. Uh, Bill Shea in his book says that the skin of this pharaoh, the, the, even with the mummy treatment, the chemical treatment, the skin was very scabrous. Liaisons on his skin looked like he had a skin disease. Hmm. During the time of the Exodus, what was the sixth plague? Skin disease. I, I realize it's translated boils, but I don't know what. Maybe the medical people can interpret what kind of disease that might have been. Leprosy? I don't know. So we have a skin problem with this pharaoh that none of the other mummies had. And we have him dying in the spring of the year. What are the chances of that happening? And now maybe we can identify his mother. Was it Hatshepsut? No, because he was married to Hatshepsut. Oh, I was talking about Moses Munner. Yeah, it, Hatshepsut it is not Moses' mother because ha, Moses was about 80 years old, according to the Bible, at the time of the Exodus. And so um, this young lady who was married to thought Moses II was young. So I don't know who the mother is, but you can go back and figure out. I haven't taken the time to propose who the mother of Moses was. And the new pharaoh was only two years old, so Hatshepsut actually took the throne for, I don't know, at least 15 years or more. I think more like 20 years. So we've nailed down the Exodus. Uh, actually, I knew 
that I had two talks sandwiched into one, so I'm not going to spend much more time on the second talk, the date for Joseph, but my confidence increases in Bible chronology because when you add up the reigns of the judges and also Saul and David and their rule, and you add up the years of oppression, and you come to Jephthah and you can nail it down to the year, you could skip back 300 years because early on in the judgeship there were judges overlapping because you have too much history to be compacted into 480 years. Or even with a new date 300 years that goes back further, you have too much history. So you have to do some overlap, and I won't bore you with that. But once you've nailed down the date of the Exodus, you can d nail down the date of the Isodus, which we don't have time for. But you'll have to get my published articles. I have three parts. And uh, I'm just dealing with part one, part one of the three parts. Part two will be on the date for Joseph, and hopefully I'll be published in the Journal of Creation. And uh, it's under review right now. Um, just, just to tease your thinking, just a little bit. The Bible says the famine was over all the face of the earth. We don't take that literally. We say, ah, that was a local famine. Well, our evangelical friends who believe in a vastly inflated chronology for Earth history, they use this as a lead argument that Joseph's famine was local. And since Genesis 1 and 2 and 6 and 7 describe all the face of the earth, the flood must have been local. See the logic? Joseph's famine is just local, little local famine. I take it literally again, all the face of the earth was a worldwide famine. Just like the flood was worldwide and covered the face of all the earth. That expression of appears in Acts and it appears in Genesis 1.29 applied to creation. If you have a local flood, then you have a local creation. Many of our evangel evangelical friends sincerely believe the creation was local just in Palestine. It was only a garden created. No more than that. Very local. But Genesis 2.6 speaks of the whole face of the earth being watered. Is that just a garden, or is that the whole earth? In the flood, the face of the whole earth was covered by water. Well, Joseph's famine was felt uh, over in China, and you have to, you can get the PowerPoint if you want and find the rest of what I have to present. And when you put Bible chronology again together, going back with another figure of 400 years, Genesis 15, 13, not the 430 years, which is the uh, rounded off figure. If you take the 400 years, literally, and put it back to back with the 300 years, then you can go back to Abraham, the 70, 75th year of Abraham, and that's 700 years before the time of Jephthah, which we've already dated as 1140 B.C., adds 700 years. Therefore, Abraham is 1840 B.C., his 75th year. And so we're able to nail it down exactly to the very year. And Bible chronology says that when Jake, or jo yeah, Jacob went into Egypt, it was 215 years after Abraham's 75th year. So do a little quick mental math. Take away 215 years from 1840 BC. You come to 1625 BC for Jacob going into Egypt. And I want to show you, yeah, there's the seven-year famine again. And that 
that dates it right on to 1625, and uh, I have a lot of slides on this. Top of the screen, I mentioned the 215 years. This is from Bible chronology. You know, Isaac was 60 years old when Jacob was born, and Jacob went into Egypt 130 years later, and you add all this up. And so you come to 1625 BC using that magical 215 years. And so, oh, let's just go back. The bottom line is that biblical chronology is amazingly accurate this far back. Now we have scholars working on Genesis 5 and 11 and see how accurate that is, but that's a whole different topic. But I'm confident that we can date events to the year back to Joseph. Time for questions now and we can have the lights on. Question or comments, I want your input because this hasn't been published yet. It's not too late to change. <laughs> Sandy is first. And we want to hear your voice. I do have a question. Um, could you review how you got the 479 from the 300? You, you OK. Jephthah the is dated to 1140 or 1139. You know, I said the years overlap. And so if you take the 1139, which is part of a year, you go back 400, 300 years. You come to 1439 BC. This is probably where I lost you. Yeah, 1439. For the entry into Palestine. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Appreciate it. Oh, and then you add the 40 years. And then you years. add the 40 years, and that's how you get to that the 1479. Oh, okay. You got it. I'm glad you're taking notes. Okay. It's a little bit complicated, isn't it? <laughs> You'll need to read my article when it comes out. Hopefully it'll come out. Yeah. Gary, let's hear Warren. from you. Be really um, hard on me because you're a no. close friend. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, I was just going to comment about the word all. You, oh, you okay. seem to take that, I take it that maybe pretty, too literally. Yeah, all. because in if you if you look at the what do you call it, the the um, the what what happened in Egypt the um, plagues. the plagues yeah the plagues there's yeah. a place where the, all the cows ha something happened That's to all right. the cows and then later on the cows came back in again. Then so cows get all, the boils later. Yeah. All, all in that case means that all that were affected, not necessarily all. So I think in the Hebrew, that when they use whatever that word is, it just means all that was affected. And you've got to take it in context. Mm -hmm. No word can be interpreted out of context. So I have to put it into a context, and I'm expanding the context to the whole world suffered the effects of that volcano that I was talking about. It affected Brissacon Pines, the tree rings of Ireland, uh, the pines of Scandinavia. Now we have two chronologies. I didn't, I just learned of another one, I think either Norway or Finland, another one going back that far. And you can see the effects on the tree rings. And then as far away as to the east as China, they had failed harvests all year long for seven years. Mm. They had a seven-year famine. They had frosts in July. And there is a Chinese chronology that's pretty accurate. They had frosts in the Chinese July. There's, there's another thing I was just thinking of. If you have like a seven-year plague or seven year famine or whatever. Yeah, famine. It seems like the people, there would be a little bit of a lag before they do something about it. Exactly. Maybe a few years. Well, and then, then maybe they, one year that they well, get desperate. Yeah, you could be. But um, then they would do their thing, you know, and then as soon as it was over with, well, how do you know if it's really over with unless it goes for another year? Exactly. So. Then you have to start planting crops, and it may take another year before you can recover. Yeah, mm -hmm. so there's a little leeway, the beginning of the famine, because they have enough stored up usually to last at least a year because of warfare. So that's why instead of 1628 B.C., 
when the volcano went off, it's probably 1627 when the famine really started hitting Egypt. And it lasted at least till 1621 and maybe even a little later. Yeah, there's a lag time. Very, very good observation. Just a, a comment. Uh, some caution may be warranted in connection of the bristlecone pine chronology. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, Bob Brown uh, wrote an article on Origins, one of the last issues that I edited about uh, caution there, and he gives an example of uh, not the bristlecone pine, but it tells you what happens on uh, here in, in uh, this dendrochronology. Uh, the, uh, in the Northwest uh, pine, master pine chronology, and uh, they had a one twenty year sample, and they were able to match it up a hundred and thirteen times into that master chronology with a 99.9% assurance. <laughs> and it's just like, you know, you find something, you can find gloves that fit your hands and some that don't. Yeah. And they, it just happened to fit that many yeah. times because the sampling was small and uh, the differences are not that significant and you can, yeah. uh, this needs to be uh, viewed with a little caution. Uh, well taken. and. I'm sure one of the reviewers, when they send their information back to me, they'll raise that very point. They'll say, well, can we as creationists really trust bristlecone pine? That's why when the email went out and the first reference was to John Woodmorap, he's the one that studied after Bob Brown had done his work. And he said, at least in the last 4,000 years, it's uh, pretty accurate. He, but it, the problems you speak of, the further back you go, the more problems you encounter. So what I'm going to do in the article, I, you know, I don't have time to defend bristlecone pine in the body of an article, but you can say a lot in a footnote. So I'll probably have to have a footnote on the very thing that you're saying, and I will document uh, Brown Brown. Yeah. Oh. Um, an observation might be made, and that is, um, in order to get a famine in Egypt and Canaan, you have to have the famine covering Canaan exactly. and the headwaters of Egypt, because exactly. uh, because Egypt doesn't really depend that much on uh, on rain that comes into exactly. Egypt itself. Yeah. So the head were, so we're talking a famine that went all the way from uh, uh, mo modern uh, Israel Palestine all the way out to uh, to Ethiopia and Central it had Africa. To affect Ethiopia. So it's a pretty large area and it you is. can say well maybe it isn't universal but if we start finding um, uh, narrow rings in various other areas, then it begins to look like maybe in this particular case, all really did mean all. A very good observation, and I'll probably at least have a footnote on weather patterns as established in recent decades. But now they have a, uh, a polar mass. You know, the North Atlantic really controls the, the weather of Palestine they're discovering. North Atlantic, because it comes down the Atlantic, across Europe, it comes across Greece and Italy, the Eastern Mediterranean, and there's a flow all the way to Ethiopia. That's what you mentioned. And so we can justifiably use Ireland as kind of a paleo thermometer of conditions even in Ethiopia. Now, if you go much further, then you have climate being affected by the Arabian Sea, but the Arabian Sea with the westerly winds affects the monsoons of India. 
So the monsoons are not in the picture. We can leave them out. But we, we're interested in what happens in the North Atlantic. I mean, that's a broad area. But I, I probably should have a footnote there. So you're making me work harder. I'll have to have more footnotes. <laughs> yeah, any other observations? I want to hear from my friend Jack. Oh. <laughs> you're ahead of me. <laughs> um. Coming from a very coming from a very different background, yeah. Yeah. I'm. I could read into your presentation that inaccur an inaccuracy of plus or minus one year would be serious. Exactly. Or, and I'm skeptical about that level of precision. I, I I'm not comfortable with that either. You know, I probably overstated a bit. In my actual paper, I say two to three years, plus or minus. So if you read the paper, I can narrow it down to a, a small window. Would you, would you be upset with plus or minus 10%? I certainly would. <laughs> so you think the data can, can be yeah, because calibrated that accurately? Because of my reading of Michael Bailey, not only his book, I've tried to read every uh, paper that he wrote, and uh, his claims are down to one year. I don't go that far. <laughs> yeah, he claims it, and most dendrochronologists do, which is scary. You pointed out that there are problems in different places. Yeah, and so we, we need a balance there. Yeah. Since you're comparing widely separated areas oh my. that are affected by a global event, but still can respond somewhat differently to there that There are local event. adaptations and responses, and meteorologists would tell you that, yeah. Not only would temperature be affected locally, but precipitation. In Asia Minor, Kunahome, the scientists, dendrochronologists, found seven years of very wide rings in the Anatolian oak chronology. He claims that they're the same event affected by the 1628 eruption. But the uh, dust coming down from wherever may have caused more precipitation in Anatolia. I have a hard time with that because why didn't it come all the way to Palestine? So I'm taking him, this is off the record, I probably shouldn't record this. <laughs> I'm taking him as maybe offering a possibility for the seven years of plenty. <laughs> I don't know, that's well, probably going too far. My comments were intended to infer that if I could read this within plus or minus 10%, I'd be pretty proud of my work. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and if I because could... Because the level of precision down to 1% or 2% is yeah. hardly imaginable. It's, in it's a fraction of 1% precision when you go back... Oh, exactly. 3,500 years. Yeah. Exactly. So my friend John Thiel is right here. Dr. Thiel. Yeah, I just have a, um, several questions. They're not necessarily closely related. But did they know the site of that volcano in I was Ireland? hoping someone would ask that. <laughs> I mean, not Ireland, but Iceland. There are two camps. And the one camp is uh, it's advocated by a Australian who came to Great Britain and established dendrochronology studies at um, the University of Reading University. And his... Uh, his uh, first name was Stuart. And I'm trying to think of his last name. Anyway, I've been in his office when I taught at Newbold College, and I've gotten well acquainted with him and his work. He was interested in the 1628 eruption because he's partly archaeologist and partly dendrochronologist and biologist. Has a fantastic background. And he was convinced that the island of Santorini, the modern island of Santorini in the eastern Mediterranean Sea, exploded in 1628. We know it exploded within plus or minus 50 years of that, but they're not sure if it actually exploded in 1628.
But this, uh, this person that I mentioned, who now is head of dendrochronology at Cornell University, very prestigious, that's the world center for dendrochronology now, especially as it relates to archaeology. And he, uh, he's absolutely convinced that this island of Thera, the ancient name Thera is now Santorini, that caused the seven-year famine. But you have to move all the archaeological dates back a hundred years or even more. And so he's locking horns with all the uh, conserv conservative biblical archaeologists. They, they say, well, that's impossible. So I didn't want to confuse you with that big debate. But they have also a volcano in Alaska, amazing. And you can see the crater today. It's spelled N-A-N-I-A-K-C-H-U-K, however you pronounce that. There's a crater there. It erupted plus or minus 50 years. You use radiocarbon dating to date that eruption. And they found the ash, micro particles of ash in the ice cores of Greenland. And if you can trust at all ice core dating, that's a big if. But it's right at the level that would be around 1640 to 1615 BC. Interesting. So that may be the best candidate. I don't know. It's okay. up in the air. So. Well, um, how do the, well, you mentioned several volcanoes now. Uh, yeah, there's Iceland, at least two and, leading and, candidates. And Alaska. Yeah. Were these on the order of the magnitude of, say, Krakatoa? Uh, these are bigger. Bigger, because I was thinking They're, Krakatoa caused yeah. worldwide cooling. And, it did. But it didn't cause worldwide devastation to the extent that this. There was an even bigger one in Indonesia, Tambora. Tambora, uh -huh. and that was the second largest historical eruption in 5,000 years, Tambora. Wow. And the largest one now, they think, is this Santorini in the eastern Mediterranean. Okay. Just another thing or two, if I may. Um, sure. Go ahead. Are there sources, uh, in extra biblical sources, of, uh, you know, maybe Moab or uh, uh, other, other other countries in, in that, well, I guess you, I don't know if you call them countries, but you know, yeah. uh, tribal in that uh, vicinity, yeah, yeah, that that have uh, a chronology. I mean, that have historical records. You do have historical records. Off. You have charts, and there is a uh, there is a story in Egypt about uh, the god of weather going this berserk, so to speak, and it's kind of called the cyclone papyrus, where you have storms, the storm papyrus, and that can be dated in that century, mm -hmm. but not to that particular decade. And it talks about mass uh, yeah. dying off. Yeah, Mother Nature was berserk, and they had a lot of storms. And Egypt doesn't get very much rain, but they had rainstorms there. And oh my but the best one, I'm glad you're asking this question. Okay. The best historical evidence outside of the Bible, outside of dendrochronology, is in Babylon. You have Babylonian records of lunar observations, right? A lot of Babylonian chronology has been calibrated with uh, lunar uh, e events and full moons and different phenomena. You have the, the dark year in Babylonian records, the year without the sun, it's called. The only time in Egypt or Babylon in 5,000 years you had a dark year without the sun that's dated to 1628 BC, according to the best Babylonian chronology. Now, there's four major Babylonian chronologies, and I like to adopt the one that fits 1628. That's probably self-serving, so I, off the record, I yeah. admit that. This is so interesting. Uh, <laughs> really, it is. But I, if, someone else if the match is correct, now we have Babylonian uh, record matching, but okay. <clears throat> premature. A lot of what I'm saying has to have a caveat that this is a work in pro progress. 
But right now I'm convinced at least a Bible chronology going back to Jephthah. We can nail that down. Okay. Anybody else? We got are you? I I find some of your agreements fascinating. I mean you got several of them that exactly precise. And uh on the other hand, uh I'm still suspicious of these general chronology figures. Uh, yes, rightly so. Rightly so. Uh, Briscoe and Pine, uh, you know, have uh, 118 matches of dead wood, which is independent floating floating matches. Yes, uh, a floating few, chronology. Fewer in the uh, oak pine sequence of Europe. Yeah. Uh, but some of those, they carbon-40 dated them first to see where they'd fit in. Good point. I'm, so, I hope uh, that is recorded. In, That's in terms uh, of that important point. Being used to calibrate carbon-14, you got a circular. Uh, yeah, that's in the creationist literature. Reasoning going on there. Just do a, a Google search or go to a website, either Answers in Genesis or creation.com. One of the articles I linked with creation.com, and they have a little box, and you can do a search on bristlecone pine. And almost all those sites mention what you said, that to, to place the floating sequences, by floating I mean the trees are not alive, they're dead. Like bristlecone, the wood is lying around. Well, how do you match it? Is it wood from a thousand years ago or eight thousand years ago. So what they did is they went to carbon 14 first and they got a date within 50 years or so, maybe a hundred years. That's where your plus and minus figure of one to five percent might be. And then once they got the ballpark, then they looked for other trees in that time frame and they were able to get a match. Now, you're right, that's a little suspect. Agreed. Are we done? Well, I have. I can uh, stay I as have long a, as you want. I have a couple of uh, uh, <laughs> observations and then leading to questions. One of them is that um, the Irish oak data um, is in conflict with the only date we have now for the city of Nineveh. Interesting. I was hoping uh, you'd which bring that I up. I was uh, influential in getting that uh, date done. It's yeah. now published, uh, Taylor et al. in Radiocarbon. Um, yeah. And uh, Basically, it suggests the possibility that there is a 150-year offset uh, of the Irish oak chronology mm -hmm. um, and raising the question of whether bristlecone pine is also off by that same amount. Someone needs to look into and, that. Uh, and so uh, our neat arrangement here may be skewed too high, uh, it's it's possible, mm -hmm. um, and I'm I'm yeah. interested in the fact that you do find uh, the chronology fitting fairly well in China. Yeah, um, I think that there's there are a lot of chronologies that that we can have greater or lesser confidence in. The other thing is that I, I think David Roll has pointed out very well that, in fact, um, a 12th dynasty uh, date for uh, Joseph fits uh, a particular area that... Uh -huh. uh, I've heard that. Uh, and, and including such things as a palace mm -hmm. uh, with a... Uh, Semitic figure with a, a striped coat on. Yeah, yeah uh, there's some matches. And and so there's, uh, 
you know, raising the question of whether the Exodus happened either at or shortly after the end of the 12th Dynasty. 12th Dynasty. And in fact, that happens to line up, believe it or not, with Isaac Newton's uh, uh, placement of the Exodus. Oh, yeah, 1491 BC. But, for, but, but see, you, what you have to do is you have to bring the 12th Dynasty down to 14. Ooh. <laughs> About what, 500 years? Uh, something of that order. Of that order. Uh, oh, I, wow. I think it's more like 400 to 200, 400 depending on what you're doing. Uh, the, the point being, though, that uh, there are a lot of moving parts here. And I, I actually liked the conclusion of the uh, fellow who wrote in Creation the, the, that yeah, article, Gary Bates. where he's saying basically there's a lot up in the air exactly. and you need to be really careful about trying to nail this down Good. too hard. And if you haven't read it, sink your teeth into it. <laughs> yeah. If you do it this afternoon, it, you, it'll either make you fall asleep or else it'll cause you to really sit up and take note. <laughs> uh, just a reaction to that, yes. Uh, David Roll proposed this, uh, I don't know, 30, 40 years ago. That idea of uh, a gap where you can reduce Egyptian chronology is still around. It's in Gary Bates. But he's not content to reduce the 18th dynasty. That's why I can speak with confidence that the dates here, anyway, for 18th dynasty are pretty well nailed down even by creationists, young earth creationists. But earlier than that, oh my, you know, a lot of room for leeway. Yeah, John. Okay. Go ahead. Um, you mentioned that Thutmose II was yeah. the pharaoh at the time. The one I pictured. Yes. And so he must not have uh, led his forces to uh, chase after the Israelites. No. And that may have been because of his skin condition, you know. That he, well, that no, he led the forces, and he drowned in the Dead Sea because one of those texts from the Psalms says that the Pharaoh drowned in the Red Sea. Oh, and there's one more text that you missed, and that is... Oh, uh, what's that? Um, Psalms, I think it's 136, oh, yeah. which uh, goes in, for his mercy endureth forever, yeah, you know, yeah. in the old King James. Uh, um, Mercy, by the way, is Hasid for those of you who heard the sermon this morning. Oh. Uh, love mercy, uh, but uh, but it does uh, make it does Pharaoh say, there. Uh, but, and and overthrew Pharaoh and his host in the Red Sea. If you want, yeah, in the Red Sea. Good. I'm going to add that to the presentation. And explain to me why? Uh, who was was it? That most the first that, that chased after them. So Thutmose the second was the one that chased. But but his mummy is present today. Or maybe That's been up. the conundrum for all conservative scholars. Okay. Uh, why isn't Pharaoh uh, destroyed totally and drowned and buried in the Red Sea rather than in the Egyptian tomb? We have that problem whether it's 1445 or 1479. The uh, explanation I offer is very simple. When you drown an army, the bodies sink to the bottom, the Israelites hightail it beyond the Red Sea, and they get as far as they can within two or three days, and then the bodies, the corpses float to the surface, other Egyptians come along, uh, the backup forces, and they retrieve the Pharaoh and as many soldiers as they can. This is a scenario, okay. it's ad hoc. I just never it's thought that happening, but interesting. Okay. Yeah. yeah. It may be true, may not be true, I don't know. Yeah, Sandy, let's hear from you. Exodus 14.10 says, And as Pharaoh drew near, the sons of Israel looked, and behold, the Egyptians were marching after ah, them. Ah, he was so leading right the forces. So it's right there in Exodus. Okay. Yeah, Pharaoh was, was in leading. the picture, definitely. Yeah. Very good. That nails that down. <laughs> Okay, maybe one more, and then it's 12 noon. <laughs> we are going. You have the last word. Um, the way you have here, I like the way you have the, the dates for the Exodus. It's going back further where 
I'm a little it curious. It's a little dicey, yeah. And the Isidus, where you have Jacob coming in, you have that 215 years, so you're putting that in the 1600s, that's only leaving the slavery time as 150 something years, which seems too short. I thought it was more it, like 400 years. It seems years. a little short. Uh, the quick answer, the quick and uh, easy answer is read, um, read the prophecy of the sojourn. And that's found in Genesis 15, starting verse 13, and especially read verse 16 and so on. And there it says, they will come out of Egypt, or out of the land of sojourn, it doesn't name Egypt. Yeah. They will come out of the land in the fourth generation. <coughs> I, again, I'm a literalist, I take that literally. And so you go from Jacob to Levi to Kohath to Moses. Fourth generation, Jacob, Levi, Kohath, oh, Amran. Uh, okay. It's not counting Jacob. So Levi, Kohath, Amram, Moses. Fourth generation, it's based on Moses and Aaron ancestry. Okay. Four generations, very simple. The other part of the question is, you were showing the tree rings for that, that date, yep. basically, and showing the seven years of famine. Right. But there has to be seven years of plenty before that. That's you have I, seven fat years before that in the rings. If, if I resurrect the slide and go back, I was going to point out the seven years of plenty are actually a, uh, five to eight years before the beginning of the famine. Now, whether so tree rings between. tell us anything about plenty, the rings are thicker, but whether the, the thick rings start about six, 1645 BC and go to about 1637. So there's a 10 year gap between great productivity and famine. And I don't know, the Bible seems to put them back to back. So I haven't solved that dilemma. Where are the years of plenty? Yeah, because of his dream. I mean, it seems definitely that it's back to back immediately. Now, remember, plenty is simply rainfall in Ethiopia. That's all you need. Right. So I don't know that I have a good link with Ethiopian um, massive rainfall. Right. So you. So. So the the, the famine for, part would yeah. be from the the. Um, I can link with a famine from the, from a volcano, but the the rains yeah, coming would. William be. Shea he documented that there are famine records in Egypt, and they measure it by the height of the Nile River. <clears throat> and they had uh, marker stones, and they had a wall, and they would record from year to year how, how high the flooding of the Nile, and they had some very low Niles. And there's an Egyptologist, a lady, who has, um, has a whole article on the flood records, and there were famines that you can identify that way, too. But not Joseph's famine. Yeah. He, Shea couldn't find Joseph's famine with the height of the Nile. Now the last part of my question is, and you probably haven't looked back, but if you look at the genealogy from Noah yeah. going down, going forward, going yeah. forward to Abraham, I mean, there's only about 300 years Not there. Not very much time for a civilization to develop, right? Right. So the further forward you push the Isidus, the further you pull the flood forward. You have to pull the flood back to about 2100 BC. That's, that's radical. Well, you'll have to read part three of my three-part series. Yes, okay. I deal with that issue. I've thought okay. about it. How much room do you have for civilization? And an ice age. We got to put an ice age in there, too. That's a lot to squeeze in. Ooh, there's a lot. Well, thank you again for coming. You've been a good good group.